Dr. Eli Ratner, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. They will brief you on some newly declassified images and videos of coercive and risky PLA operational behavior over the last year or so against U.S. aircraft operating lawfully in international airspace in the East and South China Sea regions. We will release these videos and images uh, that later this afternoon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ratner. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Sabrina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity today to speak about the newly declassified pictures and videos shared by the department today that depict the PLA's sharp increase in coercive and risky operational behavior in the East and South China Seas. And in particular, I'd also like to discuss why it represents such a significant concern. Now, as many of you know, every year for over 20 years, the Department of Defense has released what we call the China Military Power Report, or the CMPR. It's an important document because it's the department's authoritative public assessment of the PLA and the role it plays in helping to realize Beijing's broader ambitions. This year's report will be out soon, and taken together with today's announcements, it represents the department's most comprehensive depiction to date of this highly concerning behavior by the PLA. Well, last year's CMPR noted that, the P that PLA fighter jets were increasingly engaging in coercive and risky operational behavior, this year's CMPR provides a much clearer estimate of that disturbing trend. Specifically, since the fall of 2021, we have seen more than 180 such incidents, more in the past two years than in the decade before that. That's nearly 200 cases where PLA operators have performed reckless maneuvers or discharged chaff or shot off flares or approached too rapidly or too close to U.S. aircraft, all as part of trying to interfere with the ability of U.S. forces to operate safely in places where we and every country in the world have every right to be under international law. And when you take into account cases of coercive and risky PLA intercepts against other states, the number increases to nearly 300 cases against U.S. ally and partner aircraft over the last two years. Now let me take a moment to explain why this matters so much from our perspective. For decades, the United States has operated in the region safely, responsibly, and in accordance with international law, and we will continue to do so. Our, our allies and partners welcome our military presence because it advances our shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. This vision, which Secretary Austin described at the Shangri-La Dialogue this year, is characterized by respect for sovereignty, adherence to international law, belief in transparency and openness, freedom of commerce and navigation, equal rights for all states, <clears throat> and the resolution <clears throat> of disputes through peaceful means, not through coercion or conquest. And it's the peace and stability extending from this security environment that has provided the foundation for the region's shared prosperity. By contrast, the PLA's coercive and risky behavior, like the kind the department is highlighting today, seeks to intimidate and coerce members of the international community into giving up their rights under international law. It directly contradicts what the region wants for itself, and it, and it can put lives at risk, the lives of our service members, the lives of our allies and partners, service members, and even the lives of PLA operators. The examples released by the department today may each look different, whether in terms of the distance between the lawfully operating U.S. asset and the PLA asset engaged in coercive and risky behavior, or in terms of how exactly the PLA asset behaves in any given interaction. But all of these examples we've released today underscore the coercive intent of the PLA by engaging in these behaviors, particularly in international airspace. And the bottom line is that, in many cases, this type of operational behavior can cause accidents, and dangerous accidents can lead to inadvertent conflict. In January of this year, for example, an American aircraft was flying in the skies above the South China Sea, safely, responsibly, and in accordance with international law, and hundreds of miles from land. A PLA jet fighter approached our asset at a speed of hundreds of miles per hour, clearly armed, and closing to just 30 feet away. In fact, once it was there, the PLA fighter jet lingered at that narrow proximity for more than 15 minutes. Just weeks before, Indopaycom had publicly released a video of a similar incident. And for the PLA to engage in this coercive and risky behavior so soon after that incident, indeed for PLA operators to continue this behavior at all, 
points to what this year's C CMPR will describe as, and I'm quoting directly here, a centralized and concerted campaign, let me say that again, a centralized and concerted campaign to perform these risky behaviors in order to coerce a change in lawful U.S. operational activity and that of U.S. allies and partners. We've also witnessed PLA pilots deliberately interfere with and create turbulence for U.S. operators by flying in front of U.S. aircraft at close distances. Photos from an incident in January 2022 show a PLA fighter jet crossing in front of a lawfully operating U.S. asset at a distance of just 100 yards, forcing the U.S. pilot to fly through the PLA's wake. Again, this is at speeds of hundreds of miles an hour and at an altitude of tens of thousands of feet. And this is not a one-off occurrence. In May of this year, as many of you know, Indopaycom released a video of a PLA aircraft speeding along a U.S. aircraft before cutting in front of it. You can even see the physical effects of the resulting turbulence on the aircraft and the crew. This is yet another disturbing sign of the PLA's coercive and risky operational behavior at a time when the PRC has declined our invitations to open lines of military-to-military -military communication at the senior most levels. These images and videos speak for themselves. U.S. planes are operating safely, responsibly, and in accordance with international law. Indeed, the skill and professionalism of American service members should not be the only thing standing between PLA fighter pilots and a dangerous, even fatal, accident. Yet, and yet, time after time, that is exactly what has prevented a disaster in the East and South China Seas. As Secretary Austin has said on numerous occasions, the PRC can and must end this behavior, full stop. For our part, the Department will continue to raise awareness about the dangers of the PLA's coercive and risky operational behavior. We will also continue to seek open lines of military-to-military -military communication with the PLA at multiple levels, including the senior-most level, because we believe these channels are crucial for preventing competition from inadvertently veering into conflict. Finally, the United States will not be deterred or coerced. We will continue to fly, sail, and operate safely and responsibly wherever international law allows. Our forces have helped sustain peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific for decades, and we will continue to do so every day. So I hope today's announcement can help increase understanding here in Washington, across the Indo-Pacific, and around the world about why the PLA's operational behavior is so concerning. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Admiral Aquilino before we open it up to questions. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Adams. Sabrina, good to see you. Thanks for inviting me to be here today. And to all of you in the audience, I've spoken to many of you, but not all of you, so I'm honored to be here, and uh, I thank you for participating. Uh, Eli talked about the perspective and the challenges that exist as it applies to the PRC activity described uh, in the report. I'm here to talk about these concerns from my perspective as the commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM. Uh, first, let me start by stating that the service members of Indo-PACOM our uniform members, our civilian warriors every day operate in order to prevent conflict. That is prevent conflict, not provoke it. Now we do that in order to execute our functions and our missions, and that is to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. That free and open Indo-Pacific enables peace, prosperity, and stability for all the nations in the region. And we've done that for eight decades. Indo-PACOM deters conflict by being ready every day, whether it's our warfighting cop capabilities, our operations, our relationships with our allies and partners, and our exercises. Let me point out that our joint force is highly trained, disciplined, and professional. Our air operations are planned, rehearsed, and executed safely every day. As the Joint Force Commander, I'm most concerned about the potential for accidents, the way Dr. Ratner explained them. And those accidents could lead to miscalculation. We must prevent these from happening in the theater. So let me be clear, intercepts happen every day around the world. The vast majority are conducted safely and without incident. And there's no reasons for the intercepts with the PRC in the Indo-Pacific region to be any different. I'm here today because it's the operational commanders 
number one responsibility to ensure the safety of our service members. And it's a responsibility uh, I take very seriously. So highlighting these behaviors and ensuring that we can prevent them is a top priority. I want to thank you again for allowing me to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Uh, just a quick note at the top, I'd ask that you keep your questions to this topic, and then we'll brief after for news of day. So with that, I'll go to AP, Tara Kopp. Thanks for doing this. Um, Admiral Aquilino, uh, given the new conflict in the Middle East, how concerned are you that you do not or will not have the assets you need, given that there's now two carriers monitoring the Med? Um, how are you able to continue to deter China if all of these assets need to go into <coughs> potentially another um, central command conflict? And then for Dr. Ratner, uh, given that there is also now a second conflict, have you been able to speak to any of your partners or allies about increasing production to get more 155 since now both Israel and Ukraine will need them? So uh, thanks. Let me start uh, first. Uh, it, it is uh, incredibly sad to watch the actions of the terrorists in the Middle East. Uh, it's also sad to watch the illegitimate illegal war in Ukraine that's been initiated by the Russians. Uh, as it applies to the Indo-Pacific and my responsibilities, what I'll tell you is I haven't had one piece of equipment or force structure depart. The United States is a global power, and that means we can uh, deliver effects and execute our deterrence responsibilities across the globe. It, I don't think any other nation can do that at this time, but the United States can. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the Indo-Pacific Command has two aircraft carriers right now at sea as well. Uh, along with uh, a large portion of the joint force executing deterrence missions in my theater. And maybe I'll just follow up. I'm, I'm going to stay away from the questions about uh, issues related to other theaters uh, and discussions with our allies and partners. But what I will say about this question of what is the uh, events in other parts of the world mean for our policy and strategy in the Indo-Pacific and as it relates to the PRC, which is that, look, we have a 2022 national defense strategy which has described the PRC as the department's pacing challenge. That remains true today. Uh, we have a uh, presidential budget request for the department that reflects that strategy, a strategy-driven budget. Um, and we have been, uh, in addition to those investments, uh, developing new operational concepts relevant uh, to the region. Uh, we have been uh, developing a more mobile, distributed, uh, lethal, and resilient force posture in the Indo-Pacific. We've had a banner year in that regard over the last 12 months, a lot of great work in concert with uh, Indo-PACOM from Japan, the Philippines, down through Australia. Uh, and in the meantime, we have been deepening our alliances and partnerships in the region, and, and uh, to a T, our key alliances uh, and partnerships in the region are stronger than they have ever been. Um, as a result of that activity, uh, you have likely heard department leaders say repeatedly, uh, we believe deterrence is real and deterrence is strong, uh, and we're doing everything we can to keep it that way. Just as a quick follow-up to that, though, is there a concern in the region that while having to engage in both Ukraine and Israel, there might be a reduced capability to meet whatever threat is faced by uh, those, those same countries by China? Like I said, we have been taking a number of steps to strengthen our commitment to the region, strengthen our deterrent to the region, and, and we will continue to do that. Dries, right, Dries? Um, Admiral, uh, d similarly on that, have you seen any indications or any intel that the Chinese are looking at this period of not distraction, but just focus on the Middle East and, and uh, Europe um, as an opening for a potential not invasion of Taiwan, but, but operations against the island. And Eli, how many of these 180 that you described are unsafe and or unprofessional? Because that's been the standard by which we have measured dangerous behavior. So the coercive and risky seems subjective, whereas unsafe and unprofessional is what we're used to as sort of a metric for uh, what is dangerous and isn't. Yeah, first, thanks. Uh, I'm certainly not going to discuss any intel that I've seen. Uh, what I'll say is historically, certainly all nations look at what's going on in the geopolitical space, in the military space, and uh, I would expect there to be lessons learned. Uh, Indo-PACOM prepares every day uh, to ensure we execute both of the missions the Secretary gave me. Number one, to prevent conflict in the Indo-Pacific. And number two, if mission one fails, be prepared to fight and win. 
So those actions uh, go on each and every day uh, in Indopaycom, and uh, we would expect all nations to be watching these actions and then determining how that best fits into their uh, future ways. That said, uh, my forces are ready today. So just in, in response to your question, look, we have a uh, very specific, specific set of criteria that we use to articulate and describe uh, particular behaviors. That is classified. It, it should remain uh, classified. And what we are presenting today is a set of activities uh, that uh, we believe exhibit uh, observable behavior and that we have cataloged along the lines that I have described. Um, and look, I, I understand the, the desire for exactly how many of these, what's the exact number. One is too many. All right, that's our view here at the department. What we have provided uh, and will be on the uh, Pentagon website if it's not up already will be 15 specific incidences cataloging over this period from the fall of 2021 through today, the most recent case uh, in September. Uh, and every one of these is, is one too many. Great, I'm gonna go to Janie. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Russian President Putin summit will be held in Beijing. Also, North Korea and the Russia's foreign ministers meeting in the Pyongyang tomorrow. Uh, how do you analyze the strength of military cooperation and solidarity between North Korea, China, and Russia? Uh, thank you. First, uh, we watch very closely the cooperation uh, and certainly the concern from uh, Indo-PACOM is the, the uh, statement of a no re limits relationship between uh, the PRC and Russia, uh, the inability to denounce uh, bad actions globally and their increased cooperation exercises and we watch it very closely. So two authoritarian powers working that closely together is certainly concerning. Secondly, on North Korea and Russia, with the transfer of uh, weapons and capabilities that uh, you've seen and been written about in the media is also of concern. So uh, the region has uh, gotten more dangerous, and we watch very closely. Why do you think China refuses military talks with the United States? Reason why? Yeah, you're going to have to ask. Uh, my counterparts in China, I've, uh, as I've been on the record before, I've asked to speak with my counterparts, the Eastern and Southern Theater commanders now, going on two and a half years. Uh, I have yet to have one of those requests accepted, uh, and I look forward to speaking to my counterpart. I think uh, developing that relationship would be critical to maintaining the peace and stability in the region. Great. Thank you. Warren? Uh, the incidents you're talking about focus on in intercepts in the air. I was wondering, are you seeing related action or a series of incidents in the, in the maritime domain and, and an increase in, in that trend? Uh, I know there have been some incidents and some videos shared by DOD and, and others. Um, is there a similar trend you're seeing on the water? Yeah, maybe I'll take that first and then uh, pass it over to Admiral Aquilino. Um, absolutely, yes. This is part of a broader pattern of PLA behavior throughout the region throughout domains and throughout uh, geographies that uh, we're seeing this behavior uh, on the water uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. We're seeing it against allies and partners, uh, not just the United States. We're seeing it on land uh, against our Indian partners. So this is part of a much broader picture. Uh, what we wanted to do today uh, was uh, focus on this particular set, provide some, some information uh, and some data in this particular issue that we think is uh, uh, is dangerous and one that Secretary Austin has spoken about directly, publicly, uh, and privately with allies and partners, and frankly, privately with PRC counterparts when he's had the opportunity to do that. But Long, if you want to talk about the broader regional picture. Yeah, there's certainly uh, incidents in the maritime that are concerning. We released uh, one not long ago when the U.S. and Canada were transiting through the Taiwan Strait and a uh, PLA ship uh, cut directly in front of uh, the United States ship. Uh, that's one example. There are more. I think the best I would say is uh, if you look at what the Philippines have released most recently as it applies to uh, utilizing fire hoses in an attempt to blocking their movement into Second Thomas Shoal, uh, it's, it's similar to the air domain. Great. I'm going to go to Tan. 
Admiral, do you get, is there any indication of communication between the U.S. and Allied pilots and ship drivers and the Chinese? Or is it a one-way conversation or any conversation? And also, I know you can't get into intel, but is this being ordered by the highest levels of the Chinese government, or is this more a lower-level kind of military thing going on here? Yeah, I'd, I'd go to what uh, Dr. Ratner talked about as a part of the report. Uh, I think the report assesses that this is a part of a strategy uh, by the PRC, so that's point one. Point two, uh, the first thing we do at all points uh, in the operational space is attempt to communicate to ensure both parties understand uh, what are we do, where are we, what are we doing, what's our intent, to ensure we can avoid any type of accident. That is always step one. Uh, sometimes that communication happens, sometimes it doesn't, uh, and there's there's I think. I think there's video in some of those, or audio in the videos that, that articulate uh, sometimes the responses that we get. Uh, there are expansive claims that are not in accordance with international law, uh, but the United States always attempts step one to communicate and ensure we understand intent. You say sometimes it's communications. Any sense percentage, 20% of the time? Yeah, I don't have the Any percentage. Sense? Um, I'm gonna go Courtney. I saw your hand. Uh, thank you. The, um, I just wanted a clarification on your answer to Idris because I didn't understand. Are you are you saying that now it's it's classified whether and something is unsafe or unprofessional? No, no, no. What I was describing is the the very specific criteria that we use uh, around these and some of the data uh, is classified. In fact, what what you are seeing today is the result of months and months of efforts to declassify this information and sanitize it for public release. So we don't think it's in our interest and in our national interest to get into very specific details about uh, the nature of all of these incidents because uh, of how our uh, other countries may use that information. So we're not today prepared to go beyond the data which we're releasing here, but just to emphasize uh, uh, that we believe we're providing uh, a significant amount of transparency uh, into the event today. Is that a policy that only relates to Indo-Pacific Command? Because I know with for UCOM, we've had Pat Ryder stand here at the podium and tell us that something that happened with the Russian aircraft was unsafe and unprofessional. So is that And we have done that on a on a case by case basis. Uh, the question here was about very specific uh, summary data about uh, all of the events, and, and we're not prepared to share that data today. So, so okay, so just be clear that the the 180 that you referenced that were I think you said they were risky. Is that coercive? Risky and what? Coercive. Coercive. That that is. How, how for, I mean, just it, it's it's language that I think we've known for a long time, unsafe and unprofessional, and how that, that that was a characterization that I think a lot of us are just familiar with, frankly. So, how do I guess I'm having a hard time equating how how to take that information that you're putting out today with how we have characterized these sorts of things in, in, in our reporting in the past. So, is it are are, are all of these things risky and coercive considered unsafe and unprofessional then as well? Uh, I'm not going to get into additional labels. Uh, well, let me just say, it, let this. me take a shot at yeah. it, Courtney. Uh, I think what I would say is when you get to unsafe and unprofessional, that's, that's really concerning behavior, right? People's lives are at risk. What we've seen since 2001 is a set of actions that have brought airplanes much closer together than are comfortable for those in the cockpit. Uh, in other words, flying off uh, my wing at 15 feet for 45 minutes has too much of a chance to lead to an accident. We've seen an increase in those close intercepts and activities in very close proximity to our airplanes since the fall of 2001. A subset of those 180 have been unsafe, unprofessional. Great, we're gonna take one and, more and question. Sorry, we can, we can provide you with a, an articulation of the criteria that was used for these events today. We'll do that. Yep. And I know we ha our briefers have limited time, so I'm going to take one last question from Rio. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. To question to Dr. Ratner. Uh, does the Pentagon encourage allies and partners to release the Chinese unsafe be behavior to the public so that the public will get a better understanding of what the Chinese is doing? I would say uh, our position is that is their story to tell. Uh, those are their <coughs> sovereign decisions to make about releasing that information. I think from our perspective, we believe that transparency around this uh, is important for better understanding uh, about this behavior. Yeah, I would say all those things you've heard about and publicized from other nations have been publicized from other nations. What I think they show is the linkage to what we're putting out today is this is not behavior just uh, 
faced by the United States. This is behavior that many of our allies and partners are having to deal with in the region. And again, to Dr. Ratner's point, you know, one accident is too many. We went through it in 2001, and uh, certainly my intent as the operational commander is to do everything possible to ensure that we can protect our air crew and that all nations should have the expectation of being, op being able to operate safely in international airspace in the region. That's the rules-based international order that you hear us talk about so frequently. Great. Thank you, guys. I know that we have a lot of questions, but unfortunately, that's all the time our briefers have for today. And I'll be up here to take your questions. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everyone's questions today. Um, I know there were a lot, but I um, uh, just have to be respectful of folks' time. And Megan, welcome back. Nice to see you here. Um, so I just have a few things at the top here that I want to pass on and then happy to dive into questions. Um, so yesterday, as part of our continued engagement with our Israeli counterparts, Secretary Austin spoke with Minister of Defense Gallant about Israel's operations following Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack. The two have been in touch on a near daily basis since the attack, and I expect that they'll connect again soon. During yesterday's call, the Secretary reiterated that America's support for Israel's security remains ironclad and emphasized the importance of civilian safety as well as the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Hamas specifically and indiscriminately targeted civilians and was barbaric in its cruelty, reminiscent of ISIS-style attacks. This was terrorism in its clearest sense. Hamas does not speak for the Palestinian people, and we will continue to raise the importance of adhering to the rule of law and the, rule, and the law of war under which civilians may not be deliberately targeted. The department remains focused on three objectives, supporting Israel's defense through security assistance, sending a strong signal of, deterring, of deterrence to any actors who might be thinking of entering the conflict, and staying vigilant to any threats to U.S. forces in the region. We are actively providing additional security assistance to the Israeli Defense Forces. Security, uh, sorry, Secretary Austin visited an, an air base in Israel to see the latest arrival on Friday of security assistance. And our security assistance continues to flow, including munitions to meet Israel's urgent needs. With that, Secretary Austin issued a prepare to deploy order to approximately 2,000 DOD personnel from a range of units. This directive increases DOD's ability to respond quickly to the evolving security environment in the Middle East. Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and transportation and additional capabilities into the but to be clear, no decisions have been made to deploy any of these forces at this time. This order only puts these forces, uh, these units on higher alert. The secretary will continue to assess our force posture and remain in close contact with allies and partners. Also yesterday, Secretary Austin approved the extension of the Ford Carrier Strike Group's deployment in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Ford will soon be joined by the USS Eisenhower strike group, which, along with sending aircraft into the region, shows our seriousness and commitment to deterrence. And last, the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit is moving to the region. The 26th MU is an adaptable military force composed of infantry, aviation, and logistics components, all operating under one command. Positioned at sea, the 26 MU is equipped to execute amphibious missions, respond to crises, and engage in limited contingency operations across a spectrum of military scenarios. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara, why don't you start us off? Uh, thanks, Sabrina. I wanted to ask about the Al Afli uh, hospital bombing. I want to know if there's any indication um, that this was an Israeli airstrike that has potentially killed hundreds of Palestinians seeking treatment and shelter there? And if so, does that change the U.S. evaluation of whether or not to send things like JDAMs or other bombs uh, to Israel? And then separately on Ukraine, um, could you discuss the arrival of the attackums? And is this part of a continuing package of attackums for Ukraine um, and where they're possibly being sourced from? Sure. Um, 
so I've seen the reports of the the strike that you're referring to or the um, the hospital that was hit. Um, I'm aware of the reports, but I don't have anything to offer further at this time. Um, the secretary, as I mentioned, has been in regular contact with Minister Gallant, um, emphasizing again the that in this conflict that uh, the law of war is being upheld. And um, that's not only something that's been consistently delivered in, in private, but also publicly. Um, so I would just leave it at that. I just don't have more for you on those reports. Um, separately, on the attackums, you asked, I'm sorry, you asked um, where they're being sourced from. I'm, I just don't, I'm not going to. Is this uh -huh. part of an ongoing, will there be more shipments of attackums? Well, I'm not going to preview any uh, future security packages that we have that we are putting together for the Ukrainians. Um, it's something that you know we're regularly consulting with the Ukrainians on what they need, um, but I'm just not going to preview anything that might be included in, in future packages. And in terms of where, where they're sourced from, I don't, I'm just not going to get into that at this time. Great. Uh, uh, sorry, right here, Jeff. Sorry, I was looking, but here. Yeah, just a, yeah. can, you, can the Defense Department identify the, so the units that the 2,000 service members are in that the Bono are prepared to deploy. Also, uh, the, you mentioned 26 MU. One of the missions that the MU trains for is a non-combatant uh, evacuation operation. Is that why the 26 MU has been sent to the Eastern Med for a possible NEO? Um, so the 26 MU right now does not have orders. Um, they are there so that the secretary and the president can make a decision if they are needed. Um, they are in the region, but I'm not going to get into specific operational details at this time. Um, in terms of the, and I'm sorry, could you repeat your first question on the? I'm hoping you could say uh -huh. which units that roughly oh, 2,000. Yeah. Um, in terms of the units, again, this was a decision. Um, the the de the ready to deploy order was came down yesterday from the secretary. Um, it is up to the commanders to start sourcing those units to figure out who would bet best um, meet the requirements that is needed. But those units have not been identified yet. So no Courtney. one's even got no one's gotten prepared to deploy orders yet. Not yeah. yet. This is just the rec the um, the secretary made the decision yesterday, but the orders themselves and which so. units are going to be selected have not uh, been selected yet. So I don't have that full list yet. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Sure. Uh, so so far, U.S. officials, including but not limited to Secretary of Defense Austin, uh, they say repeatedly that there's no conditions set on the use of the U.S. ammunition provided to Israel. Yeah. And just in the past, uh, you've seen the uh, pictures. You say yourself that there's been an attack against uh, an hospital you know, with massive hundreds mm -hmm. of casualties. So isn't there any concern within the Department of Defense that whilst you're supplying these military assistance, you kind of part of it or like you might be militarily involved in any possible war crimes committed against civilians? So what I will say is that exactly what you just mentioned, what you just said is that we did not put any preconditions on Israel when it comes to using our security assistance. Um, from the beginning, what we have said is that governments like us, our democracies, is what separates us ourselves from Hamas. We certainly expect Israel, as with any ally or partner, to uphold the law of war. Um, it should be very clear that Hamas is the one putting Palestinians uh, or those in Gaza at great risk. I mean, they are putting their command and control um, units inside hospitals, inside areas where there are innocent civilians. Um, so the fact that they've set up command centers at these hospitals um, just shows the the brutality that they're willing to engage on, that they're willing to use civilians as um, a, a way to, to mask their operations, but also to see them as casualties. That's not how we um, democracies are going to, or how the secretary in his conversations with Minister Gallant, um, we have always emphasized that the, that the law of war be upheld. Have you seen that so far? Be upheld, laws of war by Israel? We are in constant communication with the Israelis. We, are, um, we have seen them, I think, be very deliberate about um, where they are striking, uh, continuing to target Hamas locations um, and away from civilians. Uh, Idris, then I'll go to Tom. Uh, I mean, you, you just further to this point, you talked about how, you know, what separates the U.S. and Israel from Hamas yeah. is your democracies. You expect them to follow the rule of law. But Israel has a very long and well-documented history of targeting and killing civilians. We saw it earlier this morning when the U.N. said they killed five and now roughly 500 believed to be dead. I, I, you know, I, I get the point you're trying to make, but the, that is the expectation. But why not say, given your history, even though you are an ally, 
we will put in end use monitoring systems, we will track you in the way um, that we track other countries. Why not put those guidelines in place, knowing what you know about them? We feel confident in our discussions uh, that the Secretary has had with Mr. Gallant. You just saw Secretary Blinken was um, back in Israel for a second time in just less than a week. The President is going to Israel today. Um, these are certainly things that will be discussed, but again, we did not put preconditions um, on Israel when it came to providing security assistance. We feel that Israel is and, and democracies like Israel and us um, should follow the law of war and will follow the law of war um, in protecting innocent civilians and directly targeting uh, where these known terrorists are. I guess they're not, is my point. And like, just because a command center is in a hospital, it's still a, a war crime to target those, right? So I guess what I'm saying is like, there is evidence that they are not doing what you're saying they should be doing. Why not then say, okay, we will now put in the restrictions. Well, again, in relation to the report that you're referring to, I, I've, I've seen the reports. I, I don't have any more details to provide at this time. I, again, I don't know who is responsible. We don't have all the facts, and um, I'm sure as we learn more, um, uh, you know, that will inform conversations. But right now, I'm not going to go down a hypothetical road of who is responsible for something. What I can tell you again is what the secretary has been very clear on is that we expect Israel to uphold the law of war and our priorities, our objectives in supporting Israel is making sure that Israel has what it needs um, through our security assistance, sending a continued strong message of deterrence that um, should any other actor think of entering the conflict, that they think again, um, and that we are being mindful and vigilant of any um, threats to our U.S. forces. Uh, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, along these lines about the, the law of war, the Israelis have cut off water, fuel, electricity, food, yeah. to two million people in Gaza. The ICC sees that as a violation of international law. Mm -hmm. So does the UN. What is, how does the administration see that? Is that a violation of the law of war, by well, that action? Well, we don't want to see any innocent civilians um, without water, power, the necessities that they need to survive. Right well, now, just, yeah. just a sec. So we do know that water was turn back on in um, the southern part of Gaza. Um, we're continuing to engage with the Israelis on making sure that civilians have what they need um, and that they can clear out or evacuate into safe areas. Um, you're seeing that, you're again, seeing ongoing discussions from the State Department. Um, and then tonight, the president is flying to Israel, um, where I expect that, of course, he will raise this issue. Is that the, the, those in Gaza moving south, they thought it would be safe. But Israel is bombing the Rafah area. So how is that safe? Well, again, I talked with Israel yeah. about listen. If it, if you want people to move south, you have to make it safe for them. And that's something that uh, I can assure you, the secretary has been communicating to Minister Gallant um, and is having other calls with partners and allies in the region to assure that, um, or to ensure, I should say that innocent civilians within Gaza, which includes American citizens, have a way to. Um, leave that area safely and we are also urging them to turn on um, like they did uh, water in the south part of Gaza so that civilians can have access to that. I'll go to Nancy. Thanks. Um, I, I wanted to get a couple clarifications. Is sure. there any U.S. evidence that there was a command center in this hospital? In the, I'm sorry, in, in relation to this attack? Yeah. Um, I, I just have seen the reports. I'm not sure exactly. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak to that because that gets to also intelligence. So I haven't seen which hospital, again, I've been in here, I haven't seen which hospital it was. So um, I've seen the reports, but I, I mean, I, I know what you're referring to, but I just don't have more information at this time. Uh, General Krill is in the area now. Yep. Is he currently trying to find out more? Who is he asking to determine what precisely happened at this hospital site and why it was struck? I know that General Carrilla is in the area, but I would refer you to the CENTCOM um, team to answer those questions. I just don't have more on his discussions. And lastly, you've said that Israel is launching targeted strikes, mm -hmm. um, but I think by any objective measure, the um, Israeli intelligence failed to prove. see the October 7th attack. Why do you have such, why does the Pentagon have so much confidence in Israeli intelligence to launch precise, accurate strikes in Gaza, given the failure of its intelligence community to um, see the threat to Israel leading up to the October 7th attack? 
Well, I'm not going to get into specific intelligence and um, what the Israelis are or what they can see now, but of course we are working with them um, when it comes to hostage rescue and, and recovery. Um, we feel confident that, um, you know, we, we continue to share intelligence with the Israelis. Um, we feel confident that they will be deliberate in their targeting and not target um, innocent civilians. I'm going to move on. Okay. Do you have such confidence? What in the, the consistent theme you're hearing in these questions is that the U.S. is saying civilians won't be targeted, and yet we can't get a clear answer on what it's doing to make sure that civilians weren't targeted in this case. And I'm just well, looking for some clarity on that. Yep. So I'm not going to get into private conversations that the secretary has with Minister Gallant. I can tell you that. Um, what I've heard consistently from the secretary and from this administration is that we expect all democracies, like Israel, um, to uphold the law of war. Um, that's something that's incredibly important. That's something that sets us apart from other, whether it's other governments, other terrorist organizations. Um, and that is a consistent theme that the secretary brings up in his calls, and not just the secretary, but across this administration. Yeah, James. So, just given on the same subject that we've been talking about, is it the Defense Department's position and by extension of the White House, that we trust the Israelis more than we trust the Ukrainians? Because as you've said, we have not put preconditions on the Israelis. We expect them to follow the law of war. Yet we have put conditions on the Ukrainians, particularly as it relates to cluster munitions. They are required to tell us where they've used them. They're required to keep a list of how they've used them and what targets they have had. So do we trust the Israelis more than we trust the Ukrainians? I wouldn't look at it like that. I would say that um, both Ukraine and Israel are in, engaged in two very different wars right now. Um, I would say that the way that the Ukrainians are em employing the depictums on the battlefield is responsible. They are keeping track of where they are going. Um, that is something for their own safety that they are doing in order to, when they start clearing those, uh, when they start taking back their territory to avoid further civilian casualties, to avoid um, any type of cluster munition that did not go off, that is for their security as well. And Russians have been also using cluster munitions on the battlefield as well. Let me finish. So can I just finish? Can I just finish really quick? Okay. I'm just going to finish this really quick. So again, Israel is one of our oldest, longest partners and allies in the region. We are working with them very closely when it comes to um, providing them the security assistance that they need. Um, I think, James, we have to remember that this attack is considered their 9-11. They have every right and should respond um, to the terrorists that killed innocent people. Again, in our conversations, we have been very clear that they um, that the Israelis, when engaging, continue to uphold the law of war, um, that they allow civilians, innocent civilians, safe passage. Um, but again, we have to remember that they were attacked viciously on October 7th. Yep. I'm going to move on. Yep. Fox? Yeah. Liz? Uh, what exactly um, is the U.S. and is the Pentagon doing to ensure the safety of Americans in Gaza? And um, has have any members of the uh, U.S. Embassy team gone into Gaza to help find um, the hostages? Uh, separately, um, is the 26th MU um, that's going to the region, could that be used to evacuate Americans from Gaza? Um, so on the 26th MU, right now they have not been tasked with anything in particular. So um, they are there uh, if needed um, and at the secretary and the president's discretion for whatever they feel they could be used for. Um, but they don't have orders. And so at this time, I'm just not going to get into any operational details. Um, on the... Uh, I'm sorry, on the, you had asked me one other question before that. Uh, if any of, um, oh, I'm sorry. The US is doing to ensure there the are no boots on the ground in Gaza. Yeah. Is, is the US doing anything to ensure the safety of Americans in Gaza? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Are they given any yeah. sort of different guidance? What we are, I mean, we're, the State Department is really taking the lead on that and continuing to engage um, to ensure that American citizens do have a, a way, a, a safe passage out. Um, what the department is focused on, again, is those three priorities that I listed out, which is um, sending a message to the region on deterrence, um, providing security assistance to, you, uh, to Israel, and then, of course, staying um, incredibly vigilant of any threats uh, to our U.S. forces. But beyond that, I don't have anything else. Warren. Uh, two questions. Will the U.S. conduct its own investigation of the hospital explosion in Gaza to, to have its own decision on or own clarity on whether it was a, an Israeli airstrike or something else? I'm not going to get ahead of any um, investigations that have or have not been launched. I, I 
not going to take that. And if the conflict spreads beyond Gaza and we see Hezbollah or, or other parties getting involved, does DOD have the authorities it needs to carry out whatever actions it sees fit, or does it need an AUMF if the decision is made to become involved? Um, we, of course, would certainly consult with Congress on any type of action that we would take um, that involves U.S. forces. But right now, that's a hypothetical. Um, our main goal by positioning uh, not one, but a second carrier will be there soon, is um, to send a message of deterrence, to say to ally, uh, sorry, to say to actors in the region who um, think that they might want to take advantage of this conflict, do not do that. This is not the time to do that. Um, we remain focused, of course, on um, providing Israel what it needs, but um, again, our, our also biggest biggest focus as well is, de is sending a message of deterrence to the region. Fadi. Thank you, Sabrina. I just have one clarification sure. of something you said, and I have another question. Okay. Um, you said, I believe, that y you saw the reports uh, concerning the targeting of I'm aware of the I'm reports. I'm aware of the reports about targeting the yeah. Baptist Hospital, which is under the uh, Episcopal Church in Jerusalem. Uh, but you don't have information on what happened. However, you felt the need to say that Hamas takes, mm -hmm. uses uh, hospitals to have mm -hmm. command centers. Why did you feel that you needed to put that in if you still, it's not clear what happened there to you? I, I wouldn't say that I was trying to conflate the two by any means. I was just trying to be specific, um, more specific on the fact that Hamas does integrate in high, in high um, civilian populations and tries um, to set up command centers in places where um, should be used for innocent civilians to be treated, um, should be used for innocent civilians to seek medical care. Um, I would not conflate or draw any type of comparison to the attack that I've only heard the reports. I don't even know where it is located. I am getting information from you as I'm standing up here. Um, so I really wouldn't draw the comparison. I was trying to show you that Hamas is willing to use innocent civilians as essentially human shields. That's exactly what we saw with ISIS. Um, and so I, I would be really mindful of not trying to draw any any connection there as I don't have any details on the report that you're referencing. And my question mm -hmm. is, even before this this hospital um, mm -hmm. uh, attack happened, more than 3,000 Palestinians have been killed, UN uh, uh, facilities have been targeted, 14 UN workers, uh, staff members have been killed, 11 journalists, 15, uh, 15 <laughs> thanks for correcting me. Um, you say this, we, the Pentagon doesn't put conditions on how Israel use uh, U.S. security assistance. Is this a matter of principle or should be tested against the realities on the ground? Is this like an open-ended commitment or what Israel does matter here? I would say that, of course, what Israel does matters. Absolutely. We are see I mean, absolutely this is a war. Um, and absolutely the actions that are taken, of course, matters. But that's why in our conversations, um, the secretary, this administration has been very clear about the law of war and what that means. Um, and that's what does set us aside from other, um, from other nations around the world who do not follow that. Um, so again, I think, I think that we have been very clear from all across our agencies about um, the, the incredible loss of life that we are seeing on in Israel and in Gaza, but we feel confident in our conversations with the Israelis that, and we will continue to, re to reiterate, that the law of war must be upheld. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Sabrina. Just a clarifying question. Given sure. that there's no preconditions or tracking of US material once it's gone to Israel, you can't rule out how it's, how it's been used. So it's entirely possible that US bombs have already been used to kill um, civilians in, in Gaza, whether or not that was intentional, but this entire, you can't rule that out, right? Well, that's a hypothetical, and I, I wouldn't get into that. Uh, is it hypothetical, though? Um, and, well, okay, setting aside <coughs> the, whether or not it's a hypothetical, because we don't know what's, where those bombs are going, okay. Um, does it not make your position untenable to keep saying um, again and again that there's no preconditions and that, um, you know, we, Israel respects the war of law and so on? Um, if you, that position is becoming harder and harder to sustain um, in the face of the mounting casualty rate that we're seeing uh, every day from Gaza. 
I, I, I know I've said this many times, but the secretary is having near daily conversations with his Israeli counterpart. He is speaking to allies in the region. Uh, the secretary of state was there, had an hours long conversation um, uh, with his with with the Israelis and his counterpart. Again, we we feel that the Israeli military is a very capable, very professional military. And and I know I've said this, but what sets us apart from the world, democracies like ours, is not targeting innocent civilians. And that is important. And that is what you've heard the secretary continue to say in his conversations. And that's what we will continue to say. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that US weapons specifically have been used to target civilians, then will you change your position about no conditionality or tracking of US bombs? Well, again, as I said, that is a hypothetical, and I'm just not going to get into that right now. Laura, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you just sure. about the support to is, uh, the IDF if they go in and look for the hostages. Is mm -hmm. there any type of um, support? <coughs> Can you talk to the support that DOD <coughs> is offering in terms of any special operations forces, intelligence, um, ISR, anything like that? Are there any troops on the ground in Israel dedicated to that mission? We do have a small team that has been at the embassy um, that has been engaging with their IDF counterparts when it comes to hostage recovery or hostage rescue. Um, they are sharing intelligence and have been pretty latched up with um, the Israeli Defense Forces. But in terms of intelligence, any other additional operations, I just wouldn't get into that right now. Are there plans to send additional shipments of weapons currently to Israel? Yes, um, we're gonna. You're gonna probably see a steady flow of weapons continuing to flow into Israel. I think um, as of today, there have been five C-17 aircraft missions that have successfully carried a range of security assistance into Israel. Um, those flights occurred between um, October 12th and October 16th timeframe. You're, so you're seeing almost near daily um, deliveries into Israel, and I would expect that those are going to continue to flow. Right, Carla. Can I get clarification on the 2,000 plus DOD personnel? Sure. Um, those personnel that will be preparing to deploy, should the president make that call, would they be part of U.S. deterrence? Is this a reactionary force? Uh, should Iran or Hezbollah expand the conflict, or is this additional support for Israel? So I would say that they are preparing for the to, uh, preparing to deploy. Um, I would just want to make sure that we're very clear that they have not deployed. Um, so if they are, it would be to um, surge support to the region. But what they are doing um, in terms of any type of uh, planning, again, those decisions have not been made. Um, and I think I said in my beginning, but um, what they would be focused on or what these units that would be going would be able to help um, augment in the region is air defense, security, logistics, medical, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and transportation. Okay. And then yeah. switching really quickly to Russia, do you have any update on uh, Chinese military support for Russia? I don't. Yeah. Does the president have to approve that? Like Carla just the president Yes, the president would have to approve that. Is that? Yeah. Is that, I'm sorry, I should know this. But the prepared to deploy is, a, is, an, is a, a decision that the secretary will make, but the decision to actually move them out would be at the presidential level. But Can I? Right, I, I just feel like there's been a lot of confusing reporting on this, so I just mm -hmm. want to get it. The, prepare, the president doesn't have to approve the Secretary Austin issuing a prepare to deploy order for unit. Right. Right. It's just the deployment is the threat. Okay. Right. Thank Janie. Thank you, Sabrina. The Israeli Ministry of Defense reported that uh, Hamas uh, used the North Korean rockets uh, when it detected, I mean, when it attacked Israel. And the reason mm -hmm. also North Korea uh, transported a huge amount of ammunition and uh, uh, artillery to Russia. What tools does the United States have to stop North Korea from providing these uh, weapons to Hamas or you know Russia? Thank I you. haven't seen those reports, so I'm sorry. I just wouldn't be able to offer a comment on that. Wafa? On uh, Nancy and Fadi's question sure. uh, about the command centers, uh, uh, I'm not seeking intelligence here. I'm just asking you if you can say yes or no. Have you seen evidence that Hamas is using these hospitals and schools as uh, command centers? And obviously, you're adopting the Israeli version of the story here. and 
if you didn't see this evidence, so you're justifying Israel of targeting these schools and hospitals. If you can just say yes or no. Do I would have? not say that we are, we are justifying that by any means. We are certainly uh, giving Israel the security assistance it needs to take out and, and to um, effectively push back on Hamas in Gaza. Again, I will reiterate as many times as you want. That does not mean the killing of innocent civilians. We ha expect and we have in our conversations, um, the secretary and others across this administration have reiterated the absolute need to uphold the law of war. I, again, I would not conflate the two as I just, when I walked up to this podium, just got a note about the reports of this, of this, um, this hospital. I do not know where it is located. I do not know if Hamas has a command and control center in it. All I can tell you is in the past, what we have seen of Hamas is the same thing we have seen of ISIS, is that they are willing to use human infrastructure to conceal and to hide behind uh, in order to conduct their attacks. Um, Israel has a very capable and professional military. And we believe that the security assistance that they are using in Gaza um, is going to be used properly and is going to be used um, to target Hamas, but also allowing for civilians, innocent civilians, to seek um, uh, areas where they can go for humanitarian assistance. Uh -huh. When you say properly, what do you mean by properly? Like yes. all democracy should. Chris. Yeah. I, I just and this will be, have to be the last one. Sorry, I realize I'm late for a meeting. <laughs> to, to clarify on the 2000 prepare to deploy order, you said it was up to commanders, but it's a presidential decision. So it's up to commanders to select the units. So have commanders selected units for no. specific capabilities or what? I'm just trying to find out how much delegation is to the commanders here already and how much is decided by the administration or this building? Nope. nope, that's the commanders will identify the units that would be prepared to deploy. And then if they are needed and if they are called to deploy, that would be a, uh, a decision that rises above. Can I just clarify yeah. one thing? Like sure, like but. Uh -huh. it, in, you, you're going to continue the assistance to mm -hmm. Israel, but right now it's PGMs, interceptor missiles, artillery shells, anything else, or is that pretty much? What you're saying I'm not going to get into more specifics on um, what else we are providing them. Um, we are trying to meet their requests as rapidly and as um, as quickly as we can. Um, m of course, many of the things that have been reported are th some of the things that they've requested, whether it's munitions, whether it's air defense systems. Um, but again, we are we are working to meet their needs as quickly as we can, and we'll continue to flow assistance into the into the country. Guys, I got to wrap it there. Sorry, I got to wrap it. There.